Yeah, I don't understand. Me neither. Why don't you taste like salami? When working on my giant Spongebob video, something on the back of my mind came up. There's a lot of misinformation being spread about this show. And what better way to do that than to make a video about it? Because what, what, what else am I supposed to do? So in order to educate you all, here's a list of some Spongebob misconceptions you may have heard of. Most people think the first movie is the finale to the show, and that everything before and after it happens before it. However, both the crew, show, and even movies all disprove this. And with other misconceptions on this list, some of them come from a 107 Facts video. Number 62, if Squidward reminds you of someone on occasion, it may be because he's sometimes voiced by Dan Castanella, the same actor who voices Homer Simpson. And I'm pretty sure in one of those videos, they say SpongeBob's Last Stand was supposed to be the finale. The show has already had two series finales. The first movie was meant to be the grand finale of SpongeBob SquarePants, but the network couldn't let it go. Then the SpongeBob's Last Stand special was going to mark the end of the series, but the network couldn't let it go. As as of right now, the network still can't let it go. Another thing is Spongebob could fly, with people thinking that's the finale to the show. And before you say, it was the last episode that season, Spongebob Meets the Strangler was the last episode delivered for season 3. But regardless, there's nothing to indicate that these are the finales to the show. See, this is what happens when you believe a channel that uses ChatGPT to write its videos, instead of doing actual research. TV Tropes doesn't count. The seven deadly sins thing is definitely a weird thing on this show. It was confirmed by Mr. Lawrence that this was an idea Steven Hillenburg had for the show. So we'd all be better people. This is an introspective episode. If I can right. see what's about this, that's what's fun about his character and all these characters being connected with the seven deadly sins. You know, which Steve wanted as a as a theme for this show. Did he really? Yeah, that was wow. A, as character, the, for the whole series, the seven deadly sins. The each character represented a one of the so seven deadly sins. So, which one am I? Am I? Uh... Your karate. What, what else? Is going to be? Karate is the eighth deadly sin. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's the eighth deadly sin. Very deadly. No, I'm not. I'm actually not sure which ones, but I know that was the that was the idea. It was kind of like Gilligan's Island meets. Uh, Faust. But I don't think it was a very serious thing for the show. From what I've gathered from the commentary, they aren't the seven deadly sins, but they are loosely based on the seven deadly sins. That's why for some characters, it's obvious, and with other characters, it's really hard to pinpoint. So all in all, I feel like there's better things to make a Screen Rant article on. Now, I feel like a lot of people treat flanderization as a fact, but to me, I think that's more of an opinionated thing. Maybe there is someone who thinks that Flanders just never changed. Maybe they still think, well, that's the same Ned Flanders that people always loved. And then there's, you know, cartoon reviewers who say Ned Flanders deteriorated over time. He's a decaying corpse now. <laughs> to me, SpongeBob has always just been the same. Season 1 Spongebob is the same character as Season 13 Spongebob. I think it boils down to how the show's been written over time. Like Patrick being an asshole, for example. People think it skyrocketed since Season 6 or something. But in all fairness, it's been a thing since Season 1. Being an asshole is just part of the character. Or Mr. Krabs mistreating Spongebob. That's just part of his character. In the case of, in the case of Mr. Krabs, too, he's the kind of boss that... I, I didn't want him to be just an angry, mean-spirited uh, boss. He's kind of likable. He's just flawed in that he's really greedy, but he actually likes Spongebob, and he... He, uh... He, well, I, I would say he respects him, but then at times he doesn't because he takes advantage of him. I kind of hope other people realize that flanderization is more of an opinionated thing, but if you think it's factual, uh, I can't really stop you from thinking that, so, okay.
Now, there's Spongebob theories out there that say that the characters have something wrong with them mentally, such as narcissism, depression, words that skirt around the arsler, and whatever else is on WebMD. Now, the only confirmed mental disorder that a character has is Spongebob. Ellenberg and Tom Kenny both said that Spongebob is bipolar. Spongebob spends a lot of time laughing and crying. crying. Yeah, he's, he's very total bipolar yeah, he's character. Always in the extremes. There's no in-between with Spongebob. And here's a quote from Tom Kenny. And with all this said and done, at least you know Patrick is just stupid and not whatever this TikTok's trying to prove to you. Have you ever wondered why Patrick is so dumb all the time? Well, it's because Patrick suffers from Down Syndrome. His parents loved him but couldn't handle the pain of raising him. So they kicked him out when he was only a child. Some people like to think that certain episodes of the show are holdovers. A holdover is an episode being made in one season and then getting moved to a later season. Krusty Towers is a big example of this, with a lot of people thinking it's a holdover just because they think the episode is funny, but don't want to admit that season 4 is funny. However, as of today, the only confirmed holdover of Spongebob is a place for pets, as that has a season 12 production code. Greetings, fellow Lagomorph. Perhaps you might consider sharing a sliver of your b On February 3rd, 2019, Super Bowl LIII Pepsi Halftime Show happened. It featured Maroon 5, Big Boy, and Travis Scott. Why am I talking about the Super Bowl in a SpongeBob video? Now, this Super Bowl pissed off a lot of SpongeBob fans. And here's the reason why, right here. And now, a true musical genius who needs no introduction. <laughs> oh. It's lit! Now, I'm gonna get this out of the way. I don't care for Travis Scott. If you like him, that's fine. But personally, I don't really care for him all too much. So why do SpongeBob fans hate the Super Bowl LIII Pepsi halftime show? Because they didn't play Sweet Victory. Yep. Now, Hillenburg passed away four months before the Super Bowl. And for some reason, Spongebob fans created several petitions to have Sweet Victory be played at the Super Bowl. Now, I don't know why the Super Bowl. I feel like there's other places to, you know, commemorate Hillenburg. But the Super Bowl, I feel like it's definitely not one of those things. But the petitions kept rising in numbers, and then the NFL decided to do something. The NFL teased stuff relating to Spongebob. And Spongebob fans, giddy with glee, thought this was the confirmation that they were going to play Sweet Victory at the Super Bowl. They did not play Sweet Victory at the Super Bowl as you just saw. They played Sicko Mode. As far as I'm aware, it takes several months to plan out the halftime show, such as get deals from sponsors, artists, whatever. SpongeBob's inclusion, however, was a really last minute thing, as it was made two weeks before the Super Bowl was supposed to premiere. So what happened was that they took time out of Maroon 5 to play a short SpongeBob clip. Now, you must think, oh wow, that's pretty cool. At least they did something. Which, you know, I think that's pretty cool. But, you know, SpongeBob fans weren't having it. Now, I'm not trying to defend the corporation. I could not give two poopy faces about the NFL. I just kind of find it, you know, stupid to assume that, you know, a multi-million dollar corporation that puts several months into planning out a halftime show for its biggest game of the year is gonna, you know, include Spongebob just because 3 changeorg petitions said so. Now, I'll be frank, I actually forgot that this happened, like, years ago. But an undisclosed Twitter account brought up the subject again, 
And everybody's wildin' now. Ed and Nettie been canceled for years, yo. That's why I'm confused. Hillenburg never wanted to be seen as the creator of Spongebob. All Hillenburg ever wanted to do was be treated as a normal person, and not just this big guy who created Spongebob. Though unintentionally, the Spongebob Phantom has quite the tendency to treat Hillenburg as a Walt Disney type figure. And put words in his mouth. Mostly put words in his mouth. Yeah, they like doing that a whole lot. Now, I understand that there's no ill intention with doing this. Besides putting words in its mouth, that's like highly disrespectful. I don't know why people still do that. But I've definitely seen people treat Hillenburg as this type of god in the animation industry, when all in all, he was just a normal guy who wanted to live a normal life. I think a lot of people just don't understand that. In all honesty, it feels like a lot of people online claim to know Hillenburg more than the guy's co-workers or friends. And it really does quite irk me when sizable YouTubers say that a love letter to Steven Hillenburg himself is nothing more than a corporate garbage bag. And to top it all off with a poop-flavored cherry, they place an in-memory of Steven Hillenburg at the end. No. No. You, you don't get to. You don't, you don't get to do that. You don't get to literally defile everything Spongebob grew to be in just one simple movie and act like it's okay. I just really hope that this fandom can stop acting like they knew Hillenburg more than his actual friends. Because in my opinion, that's way more disrespectful than what you think Camp Coral is. Now... I made an entire video about this subject nine months ago, and I know if I tell you guys to go watch it, you're not actually gonna go watch it. So here's a supercut of the SpongeBob spin-off debacle. Two years ago, with Steve beginning to fall ill, Karen Hillenburg called Tim Hill and asked him to work with Steve on developing the script for the third SpongeBob SquarePants film. With Steve's health failing, and the cartoon about to celebrate two decades, Hill initially recoiled at the pressure. The moment seemed to represent, I didn't want to be the guy who screws this up, he told me. Steve had an idea for the plot, and over the course of a few meetings, Hill relented and wrote the treatment. One thing led to another, and Hill's now the director, which seems fitting. It's a rescue story. Spongebob must save his pet snail Gary, who has been taken by bad guys who want to harvest his trail of slime as a valuable skin treatment, Hill said. Hill and I spoke for an hour, a conversation marked by gratitude, awe, and humor about his journey with Steve and Spongebob. Ultimately, he explained he agreed to direct the film to honor his friend. The story is nostalgic, Hill said. Steve is actually in the story, a fitting first for the cartoon. He paused and added haltingly, it's basically a love letter to Steve. It's a sad story, but it does tell us that Hillenburg did know about Sponge on the Rotten and helped develop the story for the film. As for Cam Coral, there have been tweets and interviews where they directly say that Hillenburg was involved with the development of Cam Coral, but unfortunately wasn't able to see the final product. Tom Kenny even said that Hillenburg was a bit iffy with the CGI, but soon grown to like it when the producers showed off what it could do. The only spin-off Hillenburg did not know about was the Patrick Star Show, which was developed after he passed away. But what about the interview he did where he said he didn't like spin-offs? Well, in that interview, he said that he didn't even see spin-offs happening, not that he didn't like the idea of them. Now, a thing I forgot to bring up in that video was the fact that Paul Tibbet diminished contact with Hillenburg. And since he didn't have contact with Hillenburg, he didn't know that Hillenburg worked on Camp Coral and such. So, that is why he made that tweet. And also, the Spongebob Babies thing. That's a joke. That's a very obvious joke about Muppet Babies and such. I wanted to bring those two points up just because I know people really don't read the description to videos anymore. Because, you know, i am be honest, I don't either. So, yeah. But, that is all I have to say about this. Or, me from nine months ago had to say about it. Hillenburg did not leave the show after the first movie. He did take a step down though, because he wanted to focus more on family, which I respect that. 
but he was still an executive producer, so he approved episodes and helped write them out and such. It wasn't until after the second movie where he became more involved with the show than he already was at that point. But he never left the show, and Hillenburg is very protective of Spongebob. So I really can't imagine someone as protective as Hillenburg just straight up leaving their own show. Who knows, maybe I'm the insane one for thinking that. Krabby Patties are made out of crab! <laughs> now, this one here is just for fun, but there's people who think that the Krabby Patties are made out of crab. It's a funny joke, all things considered, and it's really funny when people treat it unironically. Look, he's saying that's what I taste like because it may out crab. But the show has confirmed that the Krabby Patties are a vegan food, so it's beyond me. Which means they're disgusting. What do you say? Garbage? <laughs> Essentially, for this one, uh, little babies think that Spongeboy Ahoy ARG stuff is real, and I feel like the video I'm showing right now is enough proof to show that this isn't real. But you know, little babies eat this up anyway. <laughs> Back in the day, Nickelodeon did a thing at a football game where they gave away free burgers and labeled them as Krabby Patties. Now, any normal person would think, oh sweet, they're giving away free food. Yes, yes, sir, Krabby Patties! Krabby Patties! Enjoy the game! But apparently, people didn't like that, and you know, got mad because they disrespected Hillenburg. All because they labeled the free foiled wrapped burgers as Krabby Patties. They got mad at free food. Now, to be fair, Hillenburg has been against a real-life Krabby Patty since, you know, the show began. But I think what's important here is what he actually means here. When Hillenburg said he doesn't want real Krabby Patties, he obviously means he doesn't want restaurants to sell Krabby Patties to kids to make them buy their product. There's an obvious difference when it comes to a major fast food chain selling a Krabby Patty, and a Nick intern giving away, like, a couple of them for free. In all honesty, I don't see anything really wrong here, since, like I said, it's just a Nick intern giving away free hamburgers. It just seems like to me that people can't really connect the dots all too well. Get it? They're stupid. <laughs> A lot of video essays make Spongebob out to be this really deep and philosophical show, and I get that, 9 times out of 10, it's ironic in a way, but then you have the pizza delivery video, where it gets blame facts wrong about the animation process, and treats the episode like it's this philosophical masterpiece when it's just based on Aaron Springer being a pizza boy. I know most people know that Spongebob isn't a philosophical show or anything, but you can never really be too sure on the internet. Well, I think we all learned an important lesson here. Misinformation is really common on the internet, but you didn't need to hear a small YouTuber tell you that. But I hope you learned something from this video, and maybe you learned something about yourself too. Maybe you will take up that pottery class. Maybe you will go fishing with your dad. Or maybe you should do some other hobby I can't think of right now. Because the world's your oyster. And technically, the world's also your bathroom, but the law doesn't like that one.